pleasure to be with you to share the Word of God this morning. We're going to continue through the book of Matthew. And this morning we're going to talk about the way of the cross. The way of the cross. But before we do, let's pray together again. On that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and forevermore. Lord Jesus, I pray, help us. Give us strength. Let us be like the Apostle Paul who said, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. There is henceforth laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which will be awarded not only to me, but to all who have loved his appearing. Lord, strengthen us this day. Let your word dwell richly in us. Lord, help us live the way of the cross. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you have a Bible, you can turn to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. <clears throat> I've been reading a little bit recently about World War II. They estimate some 70 plus million people died as a result of World War II, which, was, which would have been about 3% of the world's population at that time. Uh, according to one count, uh, this is just military deaths, not civilian deaths for other purposes as part of the other reasons as part of the war, but military deaths. There's 407,000 U.S. deaths, 210,000 French deaths, 383 plus thousand U.K. deaths, Allied forces there in World War II. Those men and women fought a great evil. They paid a high price. And if they didn't, the world would be a very different place right now. You see, there's some things that you can only obtain at a high price. In fact, most things that are worth having that are of ultimate importance, aren't free. They're costly. Somebody has to pay for them. Jesus here in our text today talks about the way of the cross. The greatest thing that you and I can attain, forgiveness of sins, is the most costly thing that there is. No higher price has ever been paid that has been paid that we could be forgiven of our sins. The death of Jesus Christ on the cross. That's the way of the cross. And Jesus has to teach us to live like that because it doesn't come naturally to us. And that's what he wants to teach us in our passage today. From Matthew chapter 16, beginning in verse 21. And if you're able and willing, I invite you to stand in honor of the reading of God's word. I'm going to read beginning verse 21 through verse 28. It says, From that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Lord, far be it from you. This shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. For you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Then Jesus told his disciples, 
If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father. And then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there is some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. The word of God. You may be seated. We're going to talk about this passage under two headings this morning. Number one, setting your mind on the things of Christ. Setting your mind on the things of Christ. And number two, putting your life on the cross of Christ. Putting your life on the cross of Christ. First, setting your mind on the things of God. There's things, I say Christ, things of God. Setting your mind on the things of God. So, We said last time that Peter's confession serves as kind of the climax of the gospel narrative, especially Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's a a major turning point because we now here have the the clear expression, the clearest statement of who Jesus' identity is. Up until this point, it has been murky, even to his own disciples. But Peter can now say confidently, because, as we talked about last time, it had been revealed to him by his Father who is in heaven, that Christ is the Messiah, the Son of God. And so, all of the Gospels, and especially Matthew up to this point, right? They wrote, they wrote their Gospels because they wanted to tell you who Jesus was, but not just that, but to show you who he was by, by telling the story of who, what he did, what he taught. And, that, and as you read the Gospels, that's supposed to take you on a journey along with Jesus' very own disciples who were cloudy about who he was. And you're supposed to walk this journey with the disciples as they see more and more of what he does and as they learn more and more of what he teaches. And you're supposed to take this journey all the way up with Peter until you yourself can say, now I know too that Jesus is the Christ. The son of the living God. And, and he is. And that's, 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 the, that's what these, all these gospels are driving us to. Now, immediately after Peter's climactic confession there, Jesus had to begin immediately renovating their expectation of who the Christ was supposed to be. They know that he is the Christ now, but the problem is, is they had... <laughs> confused expectations of who the Christ was and who he should really be. We know that many during Jesus' time, not everyone, but many understood the Christ to be a, a political and military champion who would make Israel the greatest of all nations and throw off the yoke of Roman oppression. And certainly the disciples had some of these expectations. In fact, one of his disciples is identified as a zealot, which was a a group among the, the Jewish people who were who were ready and willing to use military force to try to combat Rome, which is a bad idea. And so many of them had this false expectations. Okay? And so right after Peter's grand confession, Jesus has to renovate these expectations. Jesus says, right after this confession, Jesus says he began to tell them how the, the Christ must suffer and die and on the third day be raised. And immediately after that, Peter, the same guy who just made this confession, takes Jesus aside and tries to to tell Jesus who he's supposed to be. And and the point, and he says, he said, you know, and, and, and remember, these are the same guys who later would be arguing about who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, Right? And so they're taking Jesus aside, and, and, and they're like, you know, whoa, you know, hold on a minute, Jesus. This doesn't sound right. I'm supposed, to be, I'm supposed to be one of your chief officers in your kingdom. What's all this talk about dying? What's all that about? And again, this is so amazing to me, and it speaks, I think, profoundly to the humanity of Jesus. That Peter would even feel comfortable in this situation like this to take Peter, to take Jesus 
aside and, uh, and assume to be able to rebuke Jesus, right? It, it tells you how human Jesus was, how he really was a friend of sinners, how he really was just like us in every way, yet without sin. And so he really is just this incredible person that, G, that Peter felt like he could even do something to this with. But at the same time, it shows, you know, Peter, he's kind of flip-flopping here. He just confessed Jesus is the Christ, and then he presumes to take him aside to rebuke him. And as I always say, we like to give Peter a hard time. But don't tell me you've never done this. Jesus? Are you sure you got that right? Jesus? Jesus, come here, Jesus. Why did that have to happen to me? You see, we're just like Peter. How many times in your life has you, have you thought that you know better than Jesus? So we just take him aside and say, Jesus, surely this isn't right. And when I do that and when you do that, Jesus looks at me and he says, Chad, I love you. But you're setting your mind on the things of man and not on the things of God. He's remarkably stern with Peter. Get behind me, Satan. The word there means adversary, but most translations, I think, rightly translate it Satan because Jesus is creating this contrast here. He says, get behind me, Satan, for you are a hindrance to me. Okay, Paul calls Satan the God of this world. And that's what, that's what was happening to Peter in that moment. Peter's thinking at that moment when he took Jesus aside, his thinking was more in line with Satan's than with God's at that time period, at that point. Okay, and so this, this contrast is striking here. So we ha- this is right after Peter's confession. Okay, just a little while before this, he was calling Jesus the Christ And now Jesus is calling Peter Satan. Jesus himself identified Peter as the rock on which he would build his church. Okay? Okay? And now, and now he is calling Peter a stumbling block. That's what the word the word hindrance there in the Greek is literally the word stumbling block. So Peter was going to be the rock, and now just a few moments later, he's a different kind of rock. A stumbling block. Not the rock on which the church is supposed to be built. Peter, Jesus has just blessed Peter because his confession came not from flesh and blood, but from the Father who is in heaven. And now it's Satan and not the Father that's informing Peter's thinking. And so it's not difficult to understand why most translations render it Satan because at this point, Peter is rendering a temptation to Jesus, similar to those that Satan did in the wilderness. Okay, remember the temptations of Jesus in the wilderness? He, uh, it was to turn a rock into bread. It was to bow down and worship Satan, and then all the kingdoms of the earth would be given to him. It was to jump off the pinnacle of the temple. Because the Lord said that he would save him. And the, the, the thread that ties together all those temptations is this. Is that Jesus is tempting Satan. I'm, I'm sorry. Satan is tempting Jesus. Satan is tempting Jesus to what? To receive his earthly sustenance, earthly power, earthly prestige. Without the cross. Yes. Amen. That's it. That's the temptation. Jesus, poor you. You shouldn't be out here starving in the wilderness. You're the son of God, for goodness sake. Just command this rock to be bread. Jesus, poor you. You shouldn't have to die for all these worthless wretches out there. Worship me, and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world without the cross. Peter unwittingly falls right in step with Satan by supposing that Jesus 
could obtain the crown without carrying the cross. And there's only one huge problem if that had happened. We'd all go to hell. The world would be lost. No cross, no forgiveness, no forgiveness, no salvation, no salvation, no hope. Without the cross. Peter, the rock, became the rock he didn't want to be, a stumbling block. And of course, this question, Paul says all these things were written down for our instruction. This question is clearly meant to be put to us as well. Are we setting our mind on the things of man or on the things of God? Are we too, like Peter, looking to wear a crown without carrying a cross? Dear brothers and sisters, if you want to wear the crown, you have to carry the cross. You have to. There's going to be suffering. There's going to be sorrow. There's going to be pain. There's going to be heartache. You've experienced it. There's more coming. But it's okay. Because when you carry the cross, He gives you a crown. Are we ready and willing to suffer for the name? Jesus said a servant is not greater than his master. If they call the master of the house Beelzebul, how much will they malign those of his household? If we want to reign with Jesus, we've got to be willing to suffer with Jesus. You see, Jesus had this all-consuming vision of life. You know, when he was arrested in the garden... Peter started to defend him, and he's like, Don't you know that I could call down 12 legions of angels to defend me right now? But he didn't. For you and for me. Jesus had an all consuming vision of life. He knew who he was, he knew where he was going, he knew what it was going to take to get there, and he was ready and willing to pay it. And so that's the question that we have to ask ourselves. Is our mind set on the things of man or on the things of God? Are we willing to pursue the crown by way of the cross? So number one, setting your mind on the things of God. Number two, putting your life on the cross of Christ. Putting your life on the cross of Christ. In verse 24 there, it says that Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in glory... In the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And so, off of this exchange with Peter about how he must suffer and die and be raised on the third day, he, this prompts him to address the disciples more broadly. They need to understand what it would really mean to follow the Messiah, and it was different than they were expecting. Peter didn't understand that Jesus was a king bringing in a new kind of kingdom, an upside-down sort of kingdom. To follow me, Jesus says, you must deny yourself and take up your cross. And this is what is utterly different about Christianity. This is what makes Christianity totally different than any secular worldview or ideology. It's what makes the gospel and the 2,000-year-old teachings of the church so offensive to our world today. We find ourselves in a precarious situation because we find ourselves in a world 
where most of the people in it have been shaped more by Hollywood than by the Bible. Have been raised on the mantra, follow your heart. Or in the famous song of an ice princess, let it go. (laughs) Just let it go. Do you. Let go of other expectations of you and just be a, your ice princess. Let it go. Guess what? That's teaching something to our children. About the way the world works. The world doesn't work that way. Peter, Jesus addressing Peter with this same exact mindset that we have today, says, get behind me, Satan. Because if you want to follow me, you have to deny you. And the fact is, is we live in a world where that statement is utterly scandalous. What? You're telling me that I have to Deny myself? Deny my desires? Deny what feels right to me? Yes. That's exactly what Jesus is saying. Whoever would follow me must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. You know what happens on a cross? You get nailed to it. You have to die to follow Jesus. You have to die to yourself, die to your desires, die to your wants, die to that thing that you think is so utterly important to you and say, no, I'm dead. That that old me is dead. I'm following Jesus. Yes, it's true. Jesus Christ has the audacity to look us in the eye and to say, to follow me, you must deny you. The question is this. It's very simple, but everyone has to answer it for themselves. Is Jesus worth it? And I just want to say, if you will take the time to stop and really reflect and think about who Jesus is, you'll realize he's more than worth it. If you had to deny a thousand lives for Jesus Christ, it would be worth it. When the veil is lifted in your heart, when the scales fall from your eyes and you see Jesus in his unveiled glory. Eyes, flames of fire, voice like the sound of raging waters. And you look at him who possesses heaven and earth and yet he made himself nothing for us. And he promises a crown to all who deny themselves and follow him. It's a small price to pay. What price is too high to pay when you get Jesus? Who cares if you have to deny your feelings? Who cares if you have to deny your sexual identity? Who cares if you have to deny this or that? Who cares if you have to forgive that thing that really hurt you? Who cares if you have to absorb this pain and this heartache and this sorrow? What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? To live in Jesus, you must die. To yourself. And I just want to say, there's no greater way to live than dying to yourself. The greatest lives that have ever been lived have been lived for something greater than themselves. Live for God, live for others, live to make an eternal difference in the world. That, in fact, is the greatest life that can be lived, and it comes from denying yourself. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. You see, 
the more you try to secure your life now, the more you lose your life then. You understand that this life is you, that you're if God lets you live 110 years in perfect health, your life would be a drop in the ocean of what's coming. Whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. You, you deny yourself now. God will give you more than you could ever ask for at the end. It's a small thing. But will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? What shall a man give in return for his soul? If this life is all that there is, this and this is why this is why people this is why frankly this is why people are miserable. Because they're working so hard to try to scratch and scramble and scrounge to get every ounce that they can out of this life. Because they think that this life is all that there is. And let me tell you something. If this life is all that there is, then that's exactly what you should do. But if this life isn't all that there is, then guess what? You're free. You don't have to scratch. You don't have to scrounge. You don't have to fight. You don't have to cheat and steal and do whatever you think to make your best life now because God's going to take care of that. And that you're free. You're free to deny yourself. You're free to give of yourself. You're free to give of yourself more than you ever thought you could. You're free to pour yourself out to your bone dry and then be taken up to Jesus Christ in heaven. And he'll fill you more than you ever thought you could be filled. You can pour yourself out for Jesus now. It's okay because there's more coming. The Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. We're not the final judges of our lives. Society is not the final judges of our lives. They want you to think that they are so that they can control you. But it doesn't matter what some person in a newspaper or on a TV screen thinks about your life. What matters is what Jesus Christ thinks about your life. So you're free. You're free from what your friends think. You're free from what your neighbor thinks. You're free from what the world thinks. You only have one person to please. And that's Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus is coming back. He's going to split the sky open. And as the lightning shines in the east and is seen in the west, so shall be the coming of the Son of Man. And the trump shall sound, and the dead in Christ will be raised, and he will come with his angels in the glory of his Father. And everyone, you, me, your classmate, the person across the street, the person on the TV screen, will stand before Jesus Christ to give an account for what we did in the body. And on that day, I'm, not going to, I'm only going to say this one time, but on that day, you'll be glad you listened to your preacher. Amen. I might not be right about a lot of things, but I, I promise you, I'm right on this. He's coming back. We only have one person to please. So it's okay if no one else likes you, if Jesus does. He's coming. And he's, he's telling us this. Why, why is he telling us this? Of course he's telling us this because he wants to spare us, right? He's saying, I want you to know this. Be ready. Because I'm coming. 
And finally here, as I close this morning, verse 28 there is a very difficult verse. If you've read this passage before, you wonder what it means. And so do I. There are some standing here who would not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. There's lots of different interpretations on that. Some people who are obviously wrong think that Jesus predicted his return during their lifetime and just got it wrong. Some people think that he's referring here to his kingdom coming in power in the sense of uh, the gospel going forth in power, saving the Gentiles, going out into the, the known Roman world and saving people, his kingdom coming in power in that way, and they would live to see that. Some people think this passage refers to uh, the transfiguration, which comes up after this passage, that there's, they will see the kingdom of God coming in a kind of a foreshadowing way of Christ and his glory at the transfiguration. It could mean that. Some people think it means that the, the coming of the Son of Man uh, in judgment refers to the destruction of Jerusalem. And the reason of that is in Matthew 24, which we'll get to one day, um, uh, closely connects the second coming with the destruction of Jerusalem. And we'll talk about that when we get there. Um, I'm not precisely sure exactly which one of those is the best. I probably lean towards either the transfiguration or the destruction of Jerusalem. But the point of the passage and what Jesus wants to communicate to his disciples is this. I'm coming. I'm coming. And that changes everything. The call to follow Christ is the call to die to self so that you can truly live. A life full of joy, hope, glory, self-sacrifice for the eternal good of others and for the kingdom of God. But to share in the crown, you have to carry the cross. And so as I close this morning, these are the questions that we need to ask ourselves individually as a church. Are we setting our mind on the things of man or on the things of God? Are we willing to follow Jesus wherever he takes our lives, even if that place is to a cross? Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even there, your hand will lead me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Are you willing to walk through the valley as long as you're walking through it with Jesus? That's the question we have to ask ourselves. I'll share with you this story, and then I'll be done. When we lived in Alabama, a church, I believe it was a church in the Birmingham area. I was taking some students on a mission trip. And uh, one of the students on the bus as they were driving to the Atlanta airport was named uh, Sarah. And this is a journal entry uh, from Sarah. Um, and we, we, we knew some people who, from Lakeview who had actually attended that church. Um, so there was a connection there. And uh, Sarah was on the bus, uh, headed to the airport, and she wrote this in her journal. She says, I was just sitting here on the bus feeling a little sad. I guess because I'm going to be gone so long and I was a little uncomfortable. Then I decided to read my Bible. I prayed and opened up to 1 Peter 5 and 2 Peter 1. Pretty much everything I read applies to me now. It talked about watching over the flock entrusted to you, which would be my little buddies in Botswana, humbling yourself, which I will need to do also, and that also means being a little uncomfortable. It talked about the devil prowling about like a lion, seeking, seeking whom he may devour, which he will especially be doing on this mission trip. 
and how we need to be alert and of a sober mind. And lastly, how we get to participate in his divine nature. I mean, how awesome is that? So mostly, I was reminded of why I'm here and why God has called me here. So I know that he is going to do incredible things. Sarah sent a text message to her cousins um, about this scripture. And the text message uh, had these thoughts. It says, this is such a great reminder. We are like a wisp of smoke. We're only here for a moment, and this is not about us. Life is not about us. It's about God who is eternal. So I want to dedicate the moment I am here completely and entirely to him. Teenage girl. That was the last text message Sarah ever sent. On the way to the airport, the bus got in a wreck. On June 8th, 2017, she was killed in a crash around 2.30 p.m. Sarah. She was ready. She was ready for God. She was ready to suffer for him. To deny herself. To humble herself. And her story continues on. In memory of her. I hope my story is like Sarah's. I hope my last text message is something like this. I'm a wisp of smoke. But I want to spend the one moment God gives me for him. Let's pray.